I'm Peter High, president of Meta Strategy, book author, Forbes columnist, and your host. I'm excited to share this conversation with Andy Karaboudis, the group chief information and digital officer of National Grid, a gas and energy innovator with revenues exceeding $19 billion annually. Andy graciously shared her thoughts on a variety of topics featured in my upcoming book, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. The book is available for pre-order on Amazon or through gettingtonimble.com. In this interview, we dive into several of the book's themes, including people, process, and ecosystems. Andy discusses the near and long-term considerations when hiring new talent, as well as National Grid's omni-channel approach to training. We also discuss the importance of being agile and focusing on consumer needs rather than product life cycles, the ways the company has utilized its external partnerships to create better energy solutions, and a variety of other topics. Stick around after the interview to hear more about the five themes of Getting to Nimble or visit gettingtonimble.com to learn more. Thank you. Your thesis for the book is around the importance of nimbleness predicated on the fact that change happens so rapidly in technology, but also around business models and even what we're faced with right now, which is interruptions in life that we never anticipated and how we react and the resilience with which we come back to a new normal. It requires a a whole different paradigm shift in how we approach things. It's a shift in people, it's a shift in processes, technology, ecosystem partnerships, et cetera. I love what you're writing about because Uber is one, right? Nobody imagined that. Netflix is one. I mean, all of the digital sort of stuff, the standard kind of, but it exemplifies it. But the wonderful thing, Andy, is I think there are a great number, and I know you've been kind enough to share some of the stories in private as well as very public on stages with me, private conversations and public ones about the kinds of things that you're doing in a very different environment than like an Uber or a Netflix to, to innovate and to change and so on. And I've been really heartened by the number of older organizations, larger organizations that have done the difficult work to recognize that reinvention is not only an advantage, it's a necessity. From a veteran who's been in the industry now, I guess, 35 years, I sort of look at this and say the whole world has changed. It's not just about innovating around new business models, new capabilities. It's a whole new innovation on the way we think. When I'm hiring people, I'm now not saying, you know, on one hand, I'm saying, is this my replacement? But on in some occasions, I'm also saying, is this what I need right now for the next year or two? Is this what's going to get me over the next hurdle? Because I'm really needing a shift in a real data science sort of thing, which may end up being automated later. So we're thinking in terms of short cycles and long cycles, whereas historically you would hire people when you were doing permanent hires around, oh, you know, somebody who's going to come in and be my replacement and that sort of thing. It's not, the, and, and I think it's the, the workforce, the people coming in aren't thinking that way anymore. They're thinking in terms of, this is a great experience for me to come in and do some things with these new tools and technologies, and I'll see where I go next and where it takes me. So we're thinking very differently. We're also thinking in companies around massive processes like hire to retire, procure to pay, order to cash. But by the same token, just like we used to have big, heavy monolithic systems that would manage some of those things end to end, we're thinking and hiving off and harvesting things into smaller chunk deliverables, chunk processes, et cetera. And everything I'm thinking about, there's two sides. There's a short game and a long game. Even in digital, there's a short game and a long game. There's some very quick hit things that we think about. And then we think about probably new capabilities and new models that could come that could be enduring for three to five years. So it's kind of interesting. Our thinking is, is multifaceted now as opposed to being a single sort of tried and true. Let me ask you then about strategy and how that has changed for you. Let, let me just give you kind of a, a context setting, all of which you're aware of, but there are different schools of thought in the current environment and just recent years, frankly, with the pace of change, that having a longer view to things may be less realistic as a result of the pace of change. The whole notion that as soon as you commit a strategy to paper, it's already out of date. There are others, though, that say, look, you know, I, I'm under no impression that a three-year plan means the things that are in the, on the tail end of that plan are all going to be realized. But by pushing ourselves to have that thought process, at least we're doing some really proactive thinking and all the w- winding that back in terms of the people that we need to point the processes we need to, to, to guide us in that direction. And we'll course correct and we'll change things based on the realities as time marshals on. But 
I'm curious, what, if anything, has changed for you in terms of the strategic planning process in recent years relative to when you first became a a chief? I think what's changed, we still take a long view and we take a short view because you want to do that futuring, right? Imagine a world where you have to do that and think of the long-term planning and the way our financial constructs are as well still force us into, I mean, we're quarter, quarter, quarter as public companies, but people want to know that you have a strategy and a roadmap, right? So our financial sort of investor relations constructs and all that stuff still requires that short and long-term vision. The single biggest thing that has changed, two things, right? Technology at the pace that it's changed and the voice of the customer and the consumer and the fickleness of the customer and the consumer forces us to be much more nimble and on our feet and have those short-term plans, actions, and executions in place and recognize there's more short-term behind it. You keep the long-term game. 20, 30 years ago, Peter, that was probably where we spent a lot of time thinking and strategizing. Now, I think we kind of put it out there and think of all the disruptions that might disrupt it and then think about a little bit closer to what is the next six months, next year, next year and a half, two years look like. It's a shift of weight and focus on the nearer term. I don't mean today, tomorrow, but the next, you know, year or two. You have to get accustomed culturally and be comfortable with. It will change and it's it's exciting and it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. As opposed to it changed and somebody moved my cheese and my marbles. And how do you think about that from a cultural perspective? I mean, you've worked in all all of your career that I know of with behemoths. And so, you know, it's one thing to say you and I are colleagues and we're the only people in the company. We just started a business. We are the culture. It's what we say. But when you're working with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, how do you create the impetus for change when change is necessary? First of all, you look around and you realize that the behemoths that don't change are not sticking around for very long. So there is a burning platform that says you can try to hang on to it, but then you start saying, what are the characteristics that we need in order to not be the behemoths that don't reinvent themselves? You actually have to build that muscle and it takes that muscle because things will disrupt you and you have to be able to bounce back and be able to bounce with the change. When I say bounce back, it's to a new normal kind of thing. So you have to build that muscle first yourself because you have to lead a team through those changes. Part of that team may be adverse to it and part of it may be get with the program because they're already you know, there. So you have to build the muscle of embracing change, which sounds very trite, but it's so true. You have to build the muscle of constantly learning because change by definition means something new has happened and you need to understand it. In the technology space, in the business model space, in the needs of a customer space, and in, you know, sort of these interrupts that we get. I still believe you, st- you need to have a strong strategy and a vision, a North Star of where you're going, and start you know, driving toward it. So there's some tried and true methodologies, strategy, setting objectives, and all that, right? You still need that. The horizon with which you do it is shorter, and the amount of oscillation of noise and interruption again, by technology, consumerism, is going to be a lot more often. So you need to be very resilient. I like that. You bring up change in several parts of the answer. How do you think about change management? How do you monitor that change, you know, introduce it in a way that you can understand whether it is succeeding or not, you know, track that? What, what, how, is there a school of thought or a method that you use? Yeah. So the method I use is you have to completely understand your starting point and where you're going, what the change is. I hear a lot of companies and organizations or people say, we have to transform, we have to change. But the clear definition of from what to what is not really put in place. And there might be some unknowns and you have to be comfortable, but in general, you need to know what it is you're changing from, right? And, and yeah. to break, break it down into the cultural aspect, the people aspect, the environment, the financial aspects and budgetary, because sometimes you, th- those will change the, I think I said tools and technology, and then do your work, you know, drive work streams to get there, but constantly bounce against what that North Star is and where you're going and do the modifications. It's a, it's a little bit like we talk about agile methodologies, right? What are your user stories? Where are you going? How far are you? There is an element of, I know where I'm going, what the North Star is, but you're iterating all the time and improving as you're going. Yeah, that's interesting. I also wanted to talk about ecosystems. And 
The idea is, you know, today more than ever, you need to have, and, I, and I, I'm saying this to somebody who I think, you know, embodies this as, as well as anyone I know, you need to have a great ecosystem around you. You need to have a great network of your peers. You have to have a great network of thought leaders, of, you know, people that understand the industry who may not be you know, practitioners today. You need to have, you see some of the others that I include on the list, uh, venture capitalists for insight as to where innovation is happening, where smart money is being spent. You need to understand uh, from an executive recruiter perspective, what's rising or falling in terms of skills or roles. And of course, so with a network of people to fill those where necessary, you know, you, you began the, the process of mentioning like the Ubers and Netflixes. You need to have an orientation that is where you're casting your net widely enough for insight, not just against the, the, the traditional competition. You know, you of course need to monitor them as you always will, but also what applies back from, you know, leading digital companies that we can translate in a creative way into our own environments. I wonder if you could just take a moment and reflect as somebody who, who spends a lot of time building an ecosystem and drawing insight, delivering certainly insight, but also drawing insight from it. Um, if you can reflect about, you know, sort of the value of that yourself. Huge, absolutely huge. I love that you've got this here, Peter, because as, as change becomes more prevalent and adaptation and all the things where the customer's voice and the fickleness comes through faster, you can't be expert at everything. And the models are, are constantly, who, what can you leverage and who can you pull in to help and how do you partner? Frenemies, right? Amazon is our partner. They are also our competitor. One of the companies I sit on the board for, of, you know, we make products for Amazon to sell as their product, but we sell our products on the Amazon site, right? So you're going to see much more of that. There should be very little that is off limits around what these ecosystem partners are. And you have to be, you know, exosystem aware as well, right? You have to absolutely understand everybody else's ecosystem and, you know, possibly how to leverage and all of that. But venture capital, these constructs now, which have emerged, now, there's, there's different plays you can, you can create to actually be able to achieve, you know, some of the businesses, models, successes, you know, implementations, understanding every, you know, what people do, what they expect, what they want to win with, because everybody wants to win at something, right? And how do those fit together as puzzle pieces to make a big win or a win-win? Hugely important. If you think about small areas of expertise that you can pull together to do a big transformation or win or change, it'd be much faster than trying to build it yourself or with what we used to call traditional business partners, mm. business relationships and partnerships. Yeah, that's it's really interesting. And talk a bit about, if you would, I know also you were, I think, a fairly early practitioner of the insight that uh, CIOs need to be customer uh, cognizant. I believe you and I have talked about my, my, the example I always used to give that, you know, not so long ago and, and to, to a certain degree today as well, if you asked a CIO who their customer was, they'd say their colleagues. Uh, which I always say is sort of a declaration of distance between what the IT team is doing and where value is created, if in fact that's your orientation. Um, yeah. And so talk a bit about the way in which you think about customer engagement as a source of insight and you know, innovation ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. So look, it starts with the customer, the consumer. It starts outside in completely. What is it that people can't do? What are the frictions they have? What is it they need? What is it they don't even know they need, but they're going to love, right? And when you start there and you move back in, that's where you really can develop a, how do I get this out there quickly? And how do I meet those needs or desires they don't know that people even have? You know, we used to say in the auto industry, design for manufacturing and design for lean. Efficient, effective, and operational excellence are things that you continue to strive for, but you don't win until you meet a need externally, right, with the customer and the consumer. If a CIO is missing that, especially in this day and age, Peter, not going to be successful. Fall out of love with the technology, fall in love with the idea of what the technology can do for customers or how they can build customers. I mean, that's what the name of the game is now. 
Yeah. And so I think that's really critical. What are some of the ways in which you've been, I know that you've been in different environments, so you've been in the auto industry, you've been in the high technology industry, you've been in, in, in pharmaceuticals, biotech, you've been, uh, you're now in the energy space, so very different businesses. Are there common threads in terms of how you engage with customers? I'm, I'm of course, like the, the, the topic you're discussing is very different in each of those cases, but curious, to, you know, how you, you what, what methods you've used that, that work particularly well for customer engagement? Yeah, so very different industries, very different approach, very different appetite for uh, either innovation or change, et cetera. And some of it based on regulators and, and you know, the, the product development life cycle. I always look at what's the product development life cycle of a company, right? So when you think of the drug industry, such an innovative industry, 15 years though right? You think of a car company, 24 to 36 months, probably closer to 18 to 24 now. You think about a utility and it's all real time and, and what, you know, how you can deliver energy and balancing energy and things like that. I used to think that the product development life cycle sets the tack time for the company and how nimble and how fast. They're. And to some degree, it's always been true, right? But the customer and consumer needs is the real tech time and how quickly they change. And that's what's changed for me. I used to look internally at the, cost, at, the at the company tech time set by the product development tech time. But what is true today is it's the customer that is setting the tech time, right? Whether it's the same drug repackaged to appeal to people in a different way, whether it is people now don't just want their energy, they want to understand where it came from and what the carbon footprint was and, you know, what their usage has been throughout the neighborhood, whether the, the vehicle isn't around design for manufacturing anymore, it's around tell me where it is, tell me if I can get it the way I want it and tell me if I can pick it up where I want to pick it up. So it become the same business has become very different because of that customer focus. That is the constant throughout. It's the customer that has set the need for nimble and the need for, you know, driving a nimble organization internally. And the companies that ignore that, I'm afraid, are the companies that aren't going to survive. Yeah, no, that's a great, great points. I wanted to ask you also about topics like Agile. You've already mentioned introducing Agile into the environment and the advantages of that provides DevOps, CICD, the extent to which these are all practices that, that you're, you're adopting. And the, you know, as I think about uh, t across these sorts of topics, some of the themes that cut across them are they, they're tearing down the walls of the typical silos of organizations and enabling optimally collaboration in a new way. Uh, so more horizontal collaboration as opposed yeah. to work getting done in the silos of the different disciplines represented in the divisions, functional areas, business units. Yep. Anyway, I, I'd love to understand, like, how do you think about the use of those? How do you think, I'm, I'm also curious how religious you are in any of those topics versus like, uh, they, they, you know, agile or DevOps appropriate in some places, but not others. And so yeah. defining kind of what it is and what it isn't. What are some of your thoughts? So as far as I'm concerned, you know, you can pick a methodology for development, which you say, well, we got some things that waterfall is better. Uh, you'll always find those corner cases where you could find an exception. So saying always probably wouldn't be in my vocabulary. Having a company that is agile, though, is absolutely necessary. And what do I mean by that? Understanding, you know, using design thinking. Are we focusing on the right problem? Because sometimes we focus on a problem to solve it, and then we use agile methodologies to solve a problem. But design thinking says, are we focusing on the right problem? Are we focusing on the right place to go? The company needs to be agile culturally, right? To be able to put together stories and features and things of where we're going to be. Again, with the customer at the absolute center of every conversation. And then, you know, driving that, whether you do DevOps or Sec DevOps and that, I think companies are at a level of maturity where they're going to pick how fast they get there, but they do need to get there. Mm -hmm. right? Time and value stream are the two really critical, you know, components And there. It's actually one and the same because we have to go quickly. If we figure where we're going and what we need to do and how we react to the customer, we need to move nimbly, we need to move crisply, and we need to understand where we're going. And we can't waste time in sort of handing off to different organizations in order to achieve. These concept of team of teams 
and really delivering. And we don't talk in terms, or we can't, we can't be talking in terms of release one and release two and release three. We have to be talking in terms of this feature, it's done. This feature is moving. This feature is out the door. What is actually in production and tested? Not we're 80% done with the code and 0% launched. So all of that stuff is a completely different mindset. Companies have to become agile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes very good sense. Also curious about how you think about cloud penetration, the, the extent to which one adopts cloud technologies, you know, the adoption of microservices or containerization or APIs is a, a group of topics that are you know, certainly rising, if not risen, uh, in importance in organizations. And you see, you know, at least some some technology leaders pointing to the flexibility and agility that some of those different decisions have from the past are, are paying dividends today when flexing up and flexing down becomes much more necessary. I'm curious about your thoughts about philosophically yeah. about those topics. So, so Peter, this is, and I might be an outlier here, this is where I say let's fall out of love with the technology and fall yeah. in love with speed and addressing need. So cloud, if the, if the goal is to adopt cloud, then you're falling in love with technology. If the goal is to provision compute power so I can go fast, uh, storage so I can go fast, right, et cetera, so that I can solve these problems quickly, you've got the right focus. Now, one sort of leads to another, but look at Randy Mott. Over at GM, he's created his own internal cloud. He's not using Azure. He's not using, you know, AWS. He's done his own. Set. So by some would say, oh, well, he's not on public cloud or he's not out. Right. It's about what, you know, the, the, the game is, what are we trying to do? Speed and efficiency so that we can answer features and new products. And so if we think about that way, yeah, it comes back to the technology, but it's just a five degree variation on the lens of how we've been thinking about it. Because the more we talk about cloud, the more we're talking about technology versus what it brings. Orienting towards that need for speed and, and exactly. what it enables it. Yeah, yep, which, exactly. Which I suppose, yep. you know, a lot of the things we've been talking about are in place in order to enable, again, well, nimbleness, but also the speed and, and better results and, and testing of ideas and that sort of thing. So I, I was also going to ask you with regard to some of the people disciplines. We talked about culture and thank you for your thoughts in terms of how, yep. to, how to continue to you know, modernize cultural attributes as well as to make sure that they're inculcated appropriately. I'm curious also how you think about managing the supply and demand of people and skills. Like how do you track and trace what skills are rising in importance or falling in importance and then course correct accordingly? Mm. So with people, you know, technologists have to have two sides to them. One is the understanding the technology that can come to bear in order to meet customer needs, demands, desires, and all the things we said before, right? Yep. The other is just understanding business models and understanding, you know, through anthropology and all that, how people are operating. So look, for me, it's interesting. I'll go on a little bit of a tangent, Peter. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Periscope, TikTok, all of these things, because I want to understand the younger generation or the current generation, you know, how they engage, what they see, what they like to do, where they're, where they're at, right, and, and what they're doing. That then bleeds into sort of how we need to respond or what we can do to connect with people and consumers. And it leads to then what are the skills that we need to do in order to do that, right? And so I think it's really important to be able to stay current through what's out on the market and where are people gravitating and what do they need and what are the skills that we need to deliver through whatever our business is, what that is, right? So like I'll personalize it on the utility. I need engineers that know how to do electricity balancing. We need engineers that understand, you know, how to design substations and things like that. But if those same engineers and software people don't understand how people like to receive energy and what they need to know, they won't provide areas where we can provide transparency and touch points to where people are interested to know, did my energy just come from coal, gas, solar, et cetera? If those engineers don't understand that those people care about it, we'll be building traditional things with no peepholes in. And so it's understanding the world at large and what, you know, where, where people are gravitating to in our area that becomes really important. I think, you know, one of the areas that you've covered very nicely is, which is another topic I wanted to talk to you about, is sources of innovation. As you're I'm hearing you talk about 
as I think I may have referenced earlier, casting your net really widely. TikTok is not, it will never be a direct competitor of yours. No. It's, not the, it's not in the energy business. You're not going to, you know, find the, you know, the central product for National Grid by virtue of drawing inspiration from it. But there's a lot that you can elicit both in terms of what customers want today or what they will want as the people who are the users of that become yeah. the, you know, a, a larger preponderance yeah. of your customer base. But That's also right. this kind of creative translation from the kind of unusual comparisons as opposed to, as I say, the direct competitors where, where it might be a bit more, you know, direct to see what, you know, what you're doing and what they are doing and how those relate, drawing inferences back into your own portfolio from what you're seeing in other successful digital organizations seems to me to be a really great you know, source of inspiration and innovation as well. Yeah, no, I completely agree, Peter, completely agree. And, you know, it goes back your sources of innovation, it goes back to your other question about ecosystem as well. An hour ago, I was on the phone with one of my former colleagues from Biogen, who, you know, became the CEO of a spinoff company, sold it, and is now doing some computational informatics, bioinformatics, calls me up and he says, who can you connect me with so that I can, you know, I want to do some computational biology and some of those stuff. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, yeah. I, and I'm wondering also how staying with your thought process about investigating and, and staying current on, you know, various, for example, social media outlets. I wonder how you've used that also to think about better means of communicating within your team and across the organization, since, of course, you know, all those are in various ways, forms of communication and interrelation and connection. You need to do the same thing, obviously, with your own teams, very, you know, very, very right. profoundly, needless to say. Are you, do you find that as you are using these different, you know, forums and formats, that it's also drawing inference back to you as to the best way to communicate really critical information across your team? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great observation, Peter. That It, it absolutely is, because whether we like it or not, and people can talk about a world where we have to slow down and smell the roses, and I believe in all of that as well. When we are trying to get work done and when we're trying to do things, ingesting things quickly and communicating quickly is so important. And, you know, if I can write, I'm having a nice day versus put a smiley emoji out there and communicate the same thing, we'll, we'll do the emoji, right? It's sad in some ways, but we'll do that. If people can see a do not turn sign, right, and they intuitively understand it, it becomes a global sign as well. You're now crossing the barriers of, of languages and generations, right? And if you look back at the social media, you know, the Twitter, you got really good at 140 and then you got a few more after that, right? But you all of a sudden it starts going that quickly and that's how you want more intuitive and because people want that level of simplicity in their life and intuitiveness i would say and that goes hand in hand with nimble yeah exactly right exactly. it goes hand in hand if i can write code by the way that self-documents i'm thrilled mm -hmm. right makes sense makes sense exactly i wanted to also ask you about you know data is the coin of the realm and having, you know, having access to it, being able to synthesize it appropriately, putting it into the hands in a form fully synthesized or as well synthesized as possible for people to make better and faster decisions, all critically important in this day and age. And in some ways, you know, one of the factors that, that separates leaders from laggards. I'm curious if you, you know, as you think about kind of a evolving data strategy, you know, are there steps that come to mind that you enact? Are there, you know, any nuances to how you thought about? Because, because on the, of course, the flip side is there is data everywhere, and it's not you know, the sources are ever increasing, and and so you know our our means of both getting it and synthesizing it need to kind of keep up with the uh, enormous amount of noise in order to find the signal, and you know, uh, in yeah. that noise. So anyway, any thoughts there? Yeah, self service. Peter, pure and simple. So I could talk to you about cataloging data, cleansing data, ETLs, warehouses and all that stuff. But again, I'm taking the customer perspective first. People want to have information to hand to make decisions, whether it's on the job, they want to understand their departments, their efficiency, their effectiveness, their numbers, their P&L, all of that stuff. Data for me is around we finally have to get really good at those foundational things to go into the nimble world of end users, whether it's employees, customers, consumers, want data 
and they need it in a visualization method that works for them, right? So the needing somebody to give you reports, needing somebody to even pull together, you know, a Tableau dashboard for you. We need to get to the point where I want to know this and I'd like to see it like this needs to be at everyone's fingertips. That's the new nimble world. Yeah. And sort of the, I have the data, I can do the reports and all that. And I think companies are coming a long way. But for me, the final thing is data and information needs to be self-serve. And it needs to be visualized in the way that I want it on my terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and the, the, the precursors to making that happen, what, what, have you, what have you instituted or implemented in order to facilitate that? Okay, so master data has never gone out of style, right? Employee master, customer master, product master, vendor master, all of these things. That's one. Uh, the second one is governance and making sure that you have proper governance. Who can, the crud, right? Who can create, who can replicate, who can update, who can delete? Very important. Who can visualize? Privacy has become a, you know, a complete, so it's not just who creates, replicates, updates, delete, who can look at and making sure that you've got that segmentation of privacy. So we're, we put a lot of that in place. And then, you know, obviously cleansing data. And then there's the data sciences where we're marrying sets of data. It goes back to unblurring of or no lines, right? The lines are gone, they're blurred. Where we're marrying data sets that we never thought would, you know, amount to something that are giving us interesting insights we never thought we would have, right? So all of the, those basic things into play. But the ultimate goal needs to be uh, information to anybody who needs it when they need it assuming they should have it with the proper visualizations yeah, that yeah. they can create. That's great. That's great. Thank you. That's a, what a clear, clear uh, overview of that. I want to return to the topic of innovation for a moment, a topic you and I have talked about a lot, including as a winner of the Forbes CIO Innovation Award. I wonder how you think about the need for a team to focus on innovation. There are those, so if, if I, again, oversimplifying into camps, there are those who say innovation is everyone's job. And, you know, on the one hand, you should be drawing insight naturally, of course, and innovation from all corners, no matter if they're senior or junior members of your team. There are others who say, and these are not mutually exclusive, so I, I shouldn't say camps as though they are completely separate um, entities or, or, or philosophies. But there are those who say that in order to get it done, though, you need it to be the, the, the primary job, at least of some portion of the team, so that, it, you know, the, the work that they, that they there's not like the, the day job they're returning to in lieu of focusing on innovation. And I wonder if you can kind of provide a bit of a, a thought process as to how you think about, you know, creating innovation, of fostering innovation. Yeah. So for me, Peter, I'm of the school of thought that it's both, right? Yep. If you're thinking about, you know, the next generation, in our case, you know, substations and digital twins and, and, how you, and you have a set of people, you say, this is the forward thinking team that is worried, that's thinking about a year, two, three ahead, the innovation team, what technologies are out there? What are we seeing? What's the art of the possible, right? I think that you do need some dedicated teams that do that and they do futuring. Imagine a world where you know, I never, ever have a forest fire again because of vegetation management problems, right? What would that entail, right? And so you need those things. But you also need to instill in the culture of the company that we want to be innovative and you should innovate. You know, your your day-to-day -day job, whether it's to go through RPA and automate, whether it's to, all those things are innovations. So you can have small innovations around efficiency. You can have innovations around effectiveness, what we should be working on. You can have innovations around the future of the company. We're going to disrupt ourselves. And so you need it in the uh, DNA of everyone if you want to, you know, to, to really drive a company to progress. But you also need specifically to say they're innovating the future of our industry or our company. Right. And by the way, some of the, you know, individuals that are working here could end up with a major breakthrough there. And yeah. that's why it's a continuum. It's yeah. a complete continuum. As you, as you think about managing great people on your team and that continuum, how do you think about like rotations and people going from uh, one part of the organization to another? And, and for context, if you don't mind, I, I always love saying this, especially you and I've had this conversation, but especially for those who've been in the auto industry, which for an industry that has been down and out and 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 to the to the passive observer may, might not seem you know to, may seem to be a 
don't know, a whole home industry, it has produced an outside, an extraordinary amount of, of talent, present company included. And, you know, what I've come to learn, and again, you'll, you'll correct me, of course, from your own perspective, as somebody who's lived this, is it's an industry that, that builds that key. You have a discipline in which you are expert and you are deep, but you, you only can get so far if you don't go abroad somewhere and learn how about the business yep. of Europe or, you know, you learn, learn how revenue is created and value is created and in some other, you know, discipline before you come back and then rise, rise more fully. So it's an industry, it strikes me, uh, that has produced people of unusual insight because they're not just siloed in that one area they grew up in. They understand the blinders are off and they understand right. how this business really works, yeah. which I would, I would think, and this is for you to validate for me, would then create an orientation of, of, look, if there's somebody special on my team, I want to send them away for a year or give them a quote unquote semester abroad in some other discipline to fill out their insight and their skills. Is that a fair synopsis? Absolutely. Abs and, and, and more true now than ever, Peter, since people, we can't, you can't just be specialty in one. To think about the customer, you have to think 360 degrees. To watch who's disrupting and, you know, coming into your industry. I mean, who would have ever thought Bill Gates wanted to come into the energy industry, right? Or Google wanted to go into the healthcare industry, right? You need those broad perspectives and experiences, and it's more true than ever. And I love that you said about the auto industry because, you know, I will always hold a debt of gratitude to the auto industry. You know, Ford sent me to Europe. They sent me to material planning and logistics. They sent me to manufacturing and procurement. And they had that long-term plan and sort of, which I think has gave a, a springboard to a lot of us. So it's fantastic. And that needs to continue. And you need to provide short-term training. We just bought Plural. Everybody's off, you know, with COVID. We just bought Plural Site and said, go, go train, go learn Python, go learn, right? And we have curriculum and we're letting people, but we're also now moving people across departments and we're, we're talking in terms of buybacks, right? Is there a, like, you go do that and then you come back. But if you don't want to come back, that's fine because you're, you know, you, you'll be a well-rounded individual over in engineering from software engineering. In this industry, we're also sending people out to other companies and to regulators and that sort of thing, you know, to get another side perspective as well. So it critically important and paramountly, we just tantamount importance to what you're talking about, Nimble, because the more people know and the more synapses you can pull together from your experiences, the more you'll be able to respond. So. That's interesting. Sticking on people for just a moment longer, there's also been an evolution of the way in which the evaluation of talent has happened. You know, there's a, there's a school that's rising. Still, I, I wouldn't say it's the average company that's doing so, but it, that is doing away with, I mean, literally in some cases, doing away with, you know, annual reviews or semi-annual reviews. And, and the logic goes that you ought to be having these kinds of conversations with such a frequency that that's irrelevant. And again, there, there, there are certainly hybrids of those as well, of increasing the cadence of informal, but keeping the formal. I wonder if you have a perspective on that. Yeah. So, Peter, up until very recently, I was very much on the review for, you know, ensuring people understood kind of where they came out and for, for compensation purposes. But I'm also one that people, I'm a WYSIWYG, so people know sort of feedback comes very quickly, et cetera. I think the new normal or the new, the new way of doing things is there will be such a strong competition to work on great things that people will naturally sort of rise to the top or, you know, fall out as they're working in teams. And there'll be a lot more self-selection, but the feedback has to be constant between peer-to-peer -peer as well as leader to employee. The peer-to-peer -peer feedback is sort of a new, what I'll call, and I'm not a fan of the phrase new normal, but it is sort of a new normal, right? The peer-to-peer -peer feedback is really important. And that will start, you know, sort of separating the wheat from the chaff and, and, and really driving people forward. So I see a world where performance reviews aren't, you know, aren't as important as how I'm feeling about it right now. Got it. Yeah. And the need for, for feedback in all directions, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, absolutely. Years down, up. Um, up 360, 360 degree. Yep, exactly. Good. 360. And you start things, employee engagement surveys and department surveys are probably some of the best performance reviews ever. 
right? If they're done correctly and yeah. people take them seriously and you really look at them and develop action plans around them and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Have you, do you have any nuances, just a couple of like loose end questions for, if you don't mind from a training perspective, any new ways in which you've been thinking about it? I mean, there's certainly been a revolution in terms of sources of training, even like, you know, great, great content that's not very expensive, an ability to train people without necessarily having them fly all over the place to do so. You know, what, what's, how have you been thinking about things as you train your staff? So just so you, the way you have omni-channel retail, you, to me, there's something called omni-channel training, right? And people find the mechanism or the channel that works best for them. The important thing is to have it available, right? So there are people that do super well, like I mentioned a product plural site where they get online and there's training and there's some testing and you can set curriculum. There's TED Talks, right? There is, I'm just going to sit, there's edX between, you know, UC Berkeley and Harvard and I don't, I don't know which other organization, but, you know, a consortium of universities. There is classroom training. There are still people that like to go into a classroom, right? There are webinars, there are, you know, on-site training, so much there. The trick is to provide that omni-channel training to ensure that you're building the capabilities as well as hiring the capabilities that you need as an organization, but you're also providing an opportunity to learn things that could be tangential that will spark innovation. You know, back to those blurred lines of you may learn something about retail omnichannel that really helps you over here in the industrial company and, you know, business models that change. So it's, it's omnichannel training and experience are really important. There's also the send people to other departments to learn about the business. That's great. I, pr- I really appreciate you taking time with me. I appreciate your willingness to share some of your you know, anecdotes and important experiences uh, to me. So thank you, Andy. Well, I'm honored, Peter. I really, really appreciate it as well. This interview featured insights that you'll find in my upcoming book, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. In an era of unprecedented technology progress and disruption, it's imperative that companies transform themselves to keep up with their digitally native competitors. In Getting to Nimble, I explore how companies, including Capital One, FedEx, CarMax, Domino's Pizza, The Washington Post, Walmart, and others, have modernized their practices related to people, processes, technology, ecosystems, and strategy. And I provide a framework for companies looking to do the same. To learn more, visit gettingtonimble.com.